All right, let's get started. Um, long time no see. I'm excited to be back and tell you guys about Bayesian Networks. Um, so before we dive in, I want to do a few announcements first. Um, there's four things that should be on your radar. So the scheduling homework is due tomorrow. Hopefully you guys are well aware of that. Um, the car assignment is uh, released today and it'll be due next Tuesday. So there's some um, conceptual challenges here, especially if you're not too up to speed on your probability. Uh, so the section uh, Thursday will uh, really help you go over that, so please come to that. Um, then there is a final project. Uh, you guys have hopefully all received your feedback uh, for your proposal and are actively making changes. So just to make sure that you guys are making progress, there's a progress report that is due um, next Tuesday. And for this one, the, the guidelines are all on the, the website, but just to kind of reemphasize, um, especially if you didn't uh, manage to get a baseline or oracle, we really expect that you to have that now. And also we expect you to have some sort of preliminary results with you know, some sort of implementation of your actual um, procedure or algorithm or model, and it's definitely some description of what that is. And be as concrete as possible um, as you can. Um, and finally, the exam is in about uh, two weeks. Um, I would start uh, looking at that. Um, and the, I actually, the best way, I think, to prepare for the exam is to look at the old exam problems because there's a certain style um, that you have to kind of get used to when taking the exam. So I know this is a busy time. There's a lot of things going on, but hopefully um, you guys will manage. Yeah? It's Tuesday, I believe, but I could be wrong. Read. Tuesday, but. Yeah. Let's say it's Tuesday. Yeah, it's whatever the website says. Oh, it does say it's Thursday? Okay. Well, then we'll defer to the website on that. Okay. Um, okay, so the next uh, agenda item is the Pac-Man competition. So many of you uh, worked hard to submit um, various entries into this competition. In the end, only three could uh, make it to uh, the top three. So um, here are the winners of the Pac-Man competition. is out of town, but if in the audience, uh, maybe you guys could come down. Let's give them a round of applause. And we have these uh, um, prizes, which are Pac-Man themed uh, cups, um, <laughs> filled with candy in case you didn't get enough for Halloween. So there you go. Congratulations. Um, do you guys want to say a little bit about what was your secret sauce? Um, actually, the fourth one is the simplest of all, and the third one is like um, super messy. I had like all of these um, features extra extracted from like um, the food, the capsule, the hunting, the hunting goals, and the scary goals, and then had like a combination of all that stuff. But that actually turned out to be not as simple as a very simple and naive, a naive method that, <coughs> which is similar to how everybody plays Pac-Man. If there's a hunting, uh, if there's a scared ghost, then go chase it. If there isn't, then go eat the capsule, or else go eat the food and dodge the hunt, uh, the hunting ghost. And um, also, um, I changed the, uh, I think the distance to um, DFS using like more Floyd's algorithm because the the Manhattan distance is different from um, the real distance in the in the map. So that's basically it's a very simple and like. Algorithm. So the lesson is keep it simple. Okay, Adam. I have recently seen there's a lot of different iterations that I went through, and the final one that was the best did end up being a very simple model that followed the same flow where you wanted to eat the ghosts. Uh, every eight caps in a while, you scare the ghosts in play, and then after uh, feeding all the capsules, get the food as quick as possible. I used DFS as well for tracking it down, and to speed up the DFS search, I used dynamic programming so that if it was ever tucked in just a few in transition, you would always catch that and have that local. Yeah. Okay. Great. Very okay. Well, great. Well, congrats again. <laughs> hey. All right. So keep it simple. I guess is a is a good uh, lesson. Okay. So back to our regular programming. Um, last week we started talking about factor graphs. Just a quick review of what factor graphs are. Factor graphs consist a set of variables. These variables could denote 
colors of provinces of Australia or locations of uh, objects at different time steps. Factor graphs also include a set of factors which depend on certain sets of variables. And these factors are meant to specify uh, preferences or constraints on what values are good for these variables to take on. And the weight of an assignment is the, simply the product of all of the factors, right? So there's this theme that comes up in this class, which is, I call it uh, specify locally and optimize globally, right? So it's very easy to think about how two variables might interact and how you want something local um, to happen. And these are defined in terms of the factors. But what you care about is some globally optimal solution. So the weight is a global function of all the assignment to all the variables. And last time we talked about various different types of algorithms for finding the maximum weight assignment, including backtracking search, beam search, give sampling, and so forth and so forth. Okay, so um, one example we looked at was object tracking. And in this example, we have a set of variables corresponding to the location of an unobserved object at time step i. Um, and we looked at two types of factors that captured where this object might be. There's transition factors, which capture the intuition that across two successive time steps, the object shouldn't move, it, you can't teleport, it has to remain close. And observation factors, they incorporate the information from the sensors. At each position, there's going to be some factor that kind of uh, encourages the position to be similar to what the sensor reading was. So sensor readings are noisy, so it's not a hard constraint, but it's a rather a soft constraint. Um, and last time we saw uh, this uh, demo where you can define the factor graph, and you click run, and you see all the factors which are represented in these uh, tables. And when you multiply everything together, you get um, for every joint assignment to all the variables, some number that corresponds to how good that uh, assignment was. And if you look at the maximum weight assignment, that's what the answer you would uh, return is, okay? So, so far, so good. And you can, with this framework, you can do a lot with it already. You can define a bunch of factors, you can run all the algorithms that we looked at last week. But, you know, what is, what do these factors mean? And how do you come up with them? Intuitively, you can define these factors, just you know, hack on a two if you like it, one if you don't like it. But you know, philosophically, maybe you should be a little bit bothered by this because um, these factors are kind of just arbitrary in some sense. So the goal of this uh, lecture and the um, next two will be to um, give more meaning to the factors. And we're gonna talk about Bayesian networks. It's a way to do that. So in one sentence, Bayesian networks are factor graphs plus probability. Um, just taking, taking a step back, where have we been in this course? This course has been a lot about designing new modeling frameworks. So we uh, looked at state-based models, which result in search problems and MDPs and games. And this was a useful tool for solving a lot of uh, problems already. Um, but then we looked at, uh, starting last week, cases where maybe the order of actions doesn't matter so much. And it's more natural to think about a set of variables that you want to find some assignment. And any order of, uh, is you know, permitted. Um, and you can think about that as going, maybe stepping up in abstraction, kind of going from assembly to maybe C++. And in this lecture, we're gonna talk about Bayesian networks. You can think about loosely analog analogizing going from C++ to Python. It gives you a, a kind of a more high level language to think about modeling. Um, and it's just another tool in your, your toolkit. Okay, so let's start with uh, the basics. There's a quick review of probability. Usually we see probability start with outcome spaces. I'm gonna jump directly to random variables, assuming that you have a basic um, um, CS109 knowledge. So random variables are things, in this example, are sunshine and rain. So they're variables whose values are unknown. And furthermore, there is a probability distribution over all the random variables that captures how they might interact. And um, so this is called a joint distribution. Um, so we write P, uh, this blackboard P of uh, the two random variables S and R. And this is this entire table, which specify for every possible assignment to all the variables, a single number, which is its probability. So the probability that it's sunny 
and it's not rainy is 0.7, for example. Now, so I want to distinguish uh, um, two things. One is that we're going to use uppercase letters to denote random variables and lowercase letters to denote the values that the random variables can take. And in addition, I want to point out that when I write P S equals S R equals R, that quantity expression represents a single number, which is a probability, for example, 0.7. Whereas if I write P of S and R, that expression denotes a whole distribution, which is the table. And I know these are kind of minor uh, notational differences, but I think it will uh, avoid a lot of confusion if you kind of pay attention to these. So from the joint distribution, you can use the laws of probability to derive uh, several quantities. One quantity is called the marginal distribution. And in marginal distribution, you pick a subset of the variables that you care about. Those are called the query variables. And you induce a distribution over them. So in this case, I've picked S. And what I'm saying is I only care about the probability of S. Um, I don't care about R. But R still has kind of influence on S. So I need to take R into account somehow. And the way I do this is I look at all possible values that S can take on. So look at 0. And then I look over to the joint distribution and look at all the rows that match that particular uh, S. So here I'm looking at S equals 0. So that's the first two rows. And I look at those probabilities and I sum them up. So 0.2 plus 0.08 is 0.28. And similarly for S equals 1, I look at all the rows that match S equals 1, which is the last two rows. And that gives me 0.72. Okay, so what I'm doing here is called marginal out, marginalizing out R. Because I don't care about R, I'm interested in the marginal distribution over S. So another concept which is going to be really important is uh, the conditional distribution. And the conditional distribution arises when your interests, when you have um, some evidence. So assume, let's say I observe that it's raining. So R equals 1. So I write P of S given R equals 1 to say this is the, I'm interested in the distribution over S given that it's uh, raining. And to compute this, um, I look at this condition, R equals 1, and I simply select all the rows which match that. So the second and the fourth rows. So now these are numbers, now probabilities. They don't sum to 1, right, because it's only a subset of the rows. But what I'm going to do is make them sum to 1 by normalizing. So normalizing means taking uh, the relevant numbers, 0 0.08, 0 0.02, adding them up, and dividing by that number. Okay, so I'm dividing by 0.1, which gives me the normalized distribution 0.8 and 0.2. Okay, so these two concepts are going to be really important. And if you remember from last week, uh, there we talked about marginalization as conditioning. Later in this lecture, I'll connect these uh, two concepts. Okay, any questions about uh, basic probability so far? Hopefully this is all uh, reviewed. Okay, let's move on. So suppose I have a joint distribution over some set of variables. So then in this example, it's um, sunny, it's raining, whether there's traffic, and whether it's the autumn season. Um, the way to think about this is a, as a probabilistic uh, database. Um, for every possible assignment, I have a number that is either uh, is, it's between 0 and 1. Um, so I can think about this as an oracle. This is a source of you know, truth. I don't know what any of these variables is, but I know how they behave and how they operate. Just like I, know, I don't know what the outcome of a coin flip is going to be, but I know that it's half and half heads and tails. So the main thing that we're going to do with a joint distribution is called perform probabilistic inference. Okay, so this is an important thing to you know, understand um, because we're going to spend the whole time doing probabilistic inference, so it's good to know what it is. So um, probabilistic inference, the way to think about it is that um, you observe some evidence. You wake up and you see, ah, okay, it's, it's autumn, and, um, and it's a Bay Area, so there's traffic outside, so uh, you're conditioning on some evidence, t equals 1 and a equals 1. Okay? That's what you know. And what you like to find out, um, querying this oracle, is you know, whether it's raining. So you're interested in some set of query variables. Okay? So the general form of a probabilistic inference um, a problem or task is probability of some set of query variables 
condition on some set of you know, conditioning variables which are set to particular values. And notice that there are some variables which are not mentioned in this query, such as s, and those variables are the ones that are marginalized out. So you can think about this query as combining both the marginalization and the conditioning from the previous slide. Okay, so this without loss of generality just captures everything that we seek to do with uh, distribution for the purposes of this class. Okay, so at this point, you can actually just do probabilistic inference, right? If I give you a joint distribution, um, which is this huge table with all the uh, probabilities for all the assignments, you can go and um, you compute anything you want. So now there's a kind of a slight problem here, which is that if you have n variables, and just suppose each variable takes on two values, how many possible, how many rows in the table are there? Anyone? Two to the n, right? So that's exponential, that's a lot. So if n is 100, then that's, I don't know, a lot. Um, so, so clearly we can't do this naively, right? So the first challenge is how do you even write down this joint distribution compactly? Right? I don't want to write down to the n numbers. So Bayesian networks is going to allow us to define joint distribution using the language of factor graphs. So this is really cool because now I have a very compact way of specifying what is um, implicitly something that's very, very large. The second challenge is algorithmic. How do you do inference? Right? We want to do perform uh, probabilistic inference answering queries like this. How do we do this efficiently? Again, you don't want to have to uh, go through two to the n different possibilities because that would be really, really slow. Um, and we'll see that variable elimination, Gibbs sampling, particle filtering, which is the probabilistic analog of beam search, all these algorithms that we uh, talked about last week are actually going to come into play. And we're just gonna talk about the probabilistic analog of these as opposed to finding the maximum weight assignment. All right, so now let's try to motivate why we need uh, a Bayesian networks with this following example. So um, here's the setting. So earthquake, earthquakes and burglaries are things in the world, they're bad things, um, but suppose that they're independent, right? That kind of makes sense. Um, but in your house, you've installed an alarm system, which is going to detect either uh, both earthquakes and alarms. Okay, so one day you wake up and you hear an alarm go off. Okay, so you should be alarmed. Um, but, um, but then you turn on the radio and you hear that uh, there's actually an earthquake. Um, so how does that affect your beliefs about whether there was a burglary or not? Okay, so okay, there's three options. Does it increase the probability of a burglary? Does it decrease the probability of burglary or does it not change anything at all? Okay, so how many of you think that hearing uh, the news about the earthquake on the radio increases the probability of a burglary. So a few say it increases. How many of you say it decreases? So many of you say it decreases. How many of you say uh, it doesn't change? Okay. Almost as many say it doesn't change. Hmm, okay, that's interesting. So we'll answer this question, but you know, keep on thinking about that in the back of your head. And one thing I'll say is that you know, I shouldn't, you shouldn't expect to necessarily find the right answer here just by kind of intuiting things. And one of the points of making things codified in a Bayesian network is that you don't leave anything up to your kind of vagueness. It's, it's, there's actually a correct answer that we can derive. Okay, so um, let me talk about how to go about uh, modeling this as a Bayesian network. So with this query example. So there's four steps. Um, the first step is defining what the variables are, okay? Variables. Um, so what are the variables here? Yeah. Okay, so there's a burglary, earthquake, and alarm. Okay, great. So these are the three things that we don't know about that are mentioned, okay? So the second step is um, you draw some edges, okay? So these are gonna be directed edges that correspond to notions of influence. Um, and if you, if you want cause, causality, but causality is a very uh, 
more philosophical thing, which we don't really need for this class. Um, so, but I'll, I'll use it anyway. So what causes what? So does the alarm cause bur burglaries? No, okay, I think it's the other way around, right? So burglaries cause alarm, and similarly, earthquake causes alarm. Um, and uh, these two aren't, uh, are, I said they were independent, so let's just leave that out, okay? Okay, so now I have a directly acyclic graph that <laughs> shows how all the variables are related in some way. Okay, so the third step is to define local conditional distributions. So now I'm going to go one step further and say um, how these, uh, what the probabilities of these uh, variables are. Because in the end, remember, I want to define a joint distribution of all the variables. Okay, so um, I'm going to define a local conditional distribution for each of these variables. So here I have P of B, P of E, and um, P of uh, A given B and E. So in general, a local conditional distribution is P of whatever that variable is given its parents. So the parents are the variables that directly point into it. So the parents of A are B and E, E has no parents, and A, uh, B has no parents. Okay, so in particular, what I'm going to do is now, let me flesh this out a little bit more. So what is P of B? P of B is a table that specifies only what's going on in this region of the space. So I have B and I have P of B, and I just fill out this, what are the possible values of B? Zero, one. So let's say uh, zero, one and zero. So let's say that probably a burglary is epsilon. Um, epsilon generally denotes a small number, which you hope to be the case um, here. Um, so this must be one minus epsilon because it has to sum to one. Um, and for simplicity, let's say that a probability of earthquake is also epsilon and one minus epsilon, just for simplicity. And then, okay, so th this one's a little bit more complicated. So I'm gonna write the parents, B, E, and the variable itself, A, and I'm going to look at probability of A given B and E, and now I'm gonna list out all the eight possible uh, combinations here. So it's 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, uh, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, okay? Okay, so for each of these I need to specify the probability, so zero, zero, zero. Um, and I should say that this alarm system you bought was, uh, is really good, really good. So it, um, it detects earthquakes and burglaries uh, perfectly, okay? So if there's no burglary, no earthquake, then the probability of alarm not going off should be one, right? It's perfect. And this is uh, the failure case, which is zero because um, if there's a burglary, no burglary and earthquake, the alarm shouldn't be going off. Um, and um, this is, I'm not gonna bother you with the details. You can, um, you can just fill in the rest of this. So if there's a burglary and earthquake, that should be a, uh, maybe someone should check that I'm doing this right. Um, this should be a one, this should be a zero, and this should be a one. Something like that? Okay. Okay. So now I've defined the local conditional distribution. So remember, I'm not defining the joint distribution yet. I'm just defining in, from zooming in on a particular variable, how does it relate given its parents, right? And you can think about it like you have a million nodes. I'm only, each local distribution might be only touching like a very small part. Okay, so finally, the fourth step is to define the joint distribution. Okay, this is a thing we're all after. Right, which is, what is the joint distribution over all three uh, variables here? And the joint distribution is going to be written with a blackboard P is um, B equals uh, B, um, E equals E, A equals A. So random variables equals a particular possible value. And this is defined to be the product of all the uh, local conditional distributions. So P of uh, B, P of E, and P of A given B and E. Okay, so let me reveal the slide, which hopefully should have the same content on this. 
Um, one thing I'll, I'll point out is that um, there is a difference between these small p's and these big p's. So the small p's are local conditional distributions. Um, these are things that you just define, right? There's no right or wrong. They're, you just define them. They're just true. Um, and then there's this big P, which is um, the joint distribution, which is, def again, defined to be just the product. And then from this joint distribution, you're going to read out things like marginals and conditionals, um, which might look like some of these local dis distributions, but they're, uh, right now, think about them as distinct objects. Yeah, question. So the question is, are we assuming B and E are um, independent here? Um, so let's see, how do I answer that? So yes, in this one, B and E are um, independent. Um, and uh, I'll show you a little bit further how we can kind of see that more clearly. Okay, so these are Bayesian networks. So what's the connection between this and factor graphs? Well, if you um, squint a little bit, you see that the right-hand side here is a product of things, and the left-hand side is this kind of joint uh, you know, global thing. And so what does this look like? It looks like weight equals product of factors, right? <clears throat> so let's go with that analogy, and it's actually much deeper than a just analogy. Um, and let's draw this as a equivalent factor graph, okay? So for every Bayesian network, we can actually draw it as a factor graph. So here we have B, um, E, and A. And okay, so now it's, um, you know, it's really important to note that how do the factors uh, arise? So there's a local conditional distribution, remember, for every variable. And that is a factor. So for every variable, there's a factor, right? It's tempting to look at these edges and draw factors on them, but that's, that's wrong, okay? Remember, one factor per uh, variable, okay? So this variable has a factor. That is P of B. This variable has a factor. That's P of E. And this variable has a factor. And uh, this, what does this depend on? What is its uh, scope? B and E and A, right? Okay. You know, again, a common mistake is to just put two factors here because it, it's really tempting. But one way to think about it is that, um, you know, if you think about your, your parents, they are there married and connected. So that's why these are, your parents are connected. Actually, the, um, I'm not making this up, but there's a, um, some people call uh, this process um, moralization. Um, yeah? Is the system to compute the probability of amount of water given just an earthquake or probability of alarm given just a burglary? Yeah, so the question is, can you use this to compute probability of alarm given earthquake alone or burglary alone? And the answer is you can pew whatever you want, and we'll sh I'll show you how to do that. Okay. So single factor connects all the parents, one factor per variable. Okay, got it? All right, so um, the joint distribution over all the variables, remember, is the product of all the local conditional distributions. And just for reference, this is what it is. Um, and now you can um, go and answer questions about this. So this is kind of the fun part. And I'm not going to go through the details of how this is done, but I'm just gonna show you kind of the interface, um, what you would expect. So again, this is um, uh, the definition of the alarm network. Um, using the same machinery as a factor graph, because it is a factor graph. Um, and first we're gonna ask, what is the probability of B? So what is that? That says, in the absence of any information, is there a burglary or not? Okay, so what do you think that should be? Oh, um, and epsilon here is uh, 0 0.05. So I think I heard it, 0 0.05, someone said that. Okay, so indeed the probability of a burglary is 0 0.05. Um, 
should be intuitive. Um, and now suppose I, uh, the alarm went off. Okay, so now what's the probability of burglary? So what is P of B given A equals one? Does it go up or down? Should go up if your alarm's working. Um, and indeed we see that probability of burglary given alarm equals one is 0.51. Okay. And now the modem of truth, what happens if we condition on the fact that there's also an earthquake? So let's do this. And you get 0 0.05. So many of you are correct um, when you said that the probability of an earthquake goes down. Okay? And intuitively, you can think of uh, it makes sense from um, this phenomenon called a, in explaining away. So explaining away happens when you have structures that look like this, and you have, suppose you have two causes, positive influencing an effect. So by positive influence, I mean that if you flip uh, B equals from zero to one, then the probability of A goes up. And um, so explaining away says that condition on the effect, conditioning on one cause reduces the probability of the other one, okay? So at some level, this makes sense because you know, this A is either B or, uh, uh, is either driven by B or E, and I don't know which one it is if I just heard the alarm go off. But B, each of these is very small, has very small probability. So the moment I kind, kind of uh, see that one of them explain this cause, see that one of them is true, then I, I kind of revert back to the, my prior belief on the, you know, the other one. Okay, so humans do this all the time when you're reasoning, when you're thinking about like, oh, what, what causes? And you find one, one cause and you discount all the other ones. So, um, now the thing that's kind of interesting here is that I did say that B and E are independent, which is also true, right? So this might have led people to think like, well, it shouldn't change because they're independent, so why should the, the probability change? But the key thing is that when you condition on A, you actually change uh, the independent structure of the model. So this is why writing things down really precisely is helpful to kind of reconcile these seemingly um, contradictory you know, intuitions that you might get. Okay, any questions about this? All right, let's move on. So we've talked about the alarm network. This is your first example of a small Bayesian network. Um, hopefully you have an idea of the intuition behind it. So now I'm gonna generalize it. Um, and the generalization shouldn't be surprising. So in general, I have n random variables, usually denoted x1 through xn. Um, and a Bayesian network is a direct acyclic graph over these variables. And it defines a joint distribution over all the variables, like this, x1 through xn. And this is defined as a product of local conditional distributions, one for each node. Okay, so this is a product of all n, xi given x parents of i. And this notation just means the values assigned to the parents of i. Okay, so this is a very general framework. Um, and, um, just like factor graphs are a very you know, general framework. But the key difference from factor graphs is the fact that these factors aren't arbitrary. Right? There are local conditional distributions. And what does that mean? That means all factors satisfy this property. So if you pick up a factor for the ith node, p of xi given x parents is equal to one if you sum over all of the possible value that xi can take on. That's what it means to be a uh, you know, probability distribution. And this is true for every setting of uh, X parents. So this property has two um, implications, um, which I'll discuss. Consistency of sub Bayesian networks and consistency of conditional distributions. Um, and these properties are gonna allow us to um, really uh, you know, take advantage of the probabilistic structure when we're doing inference. Okay, so the first thing is, the question is, suppose I have this um, Bayesian network, this alarm network, and um, 
I'm going to, suppose I'm interested in the marginal distribution of only B and E, okay? I don't care about A. So remember, this is um, the joint distribution, and by laws of probability, I can derive the um, marginal distribution. Now the question is, what does this marginal distribution have to do with uh, the Bayesian network, the graph here? Okay. Um, so let's go through some algebra to find out. So this is a sum over all A, and by definition, this is just the product of all the local conditional distributions, as we just discussed. And now, I notice that P of B and P of E don't depend on A, which means that I can pull this out and push the summation in. That's just uh, you know, algebraic manipulation. And then what is this value? This value is just one because of a previous slide. So I can just drop it, and now I have P of B times P of E. And lo and behold, what is, what is this? This is, if you had just gone and defined a miniature Bayesian network over B and E, this was exactly what you've written down. Okay, so that's, that's kind of cool. So the general idea here is that when you're marginalizing out uh, a leaf node, um, that yields a Bayesian network just without that node. So marginalization produces this, um, this Bayesian network where you've just erased um, the, very, the leaf node along with its incoming edges, right? So in other words, I've turned basically what was, would have been a algebraic operation into a graphical one. And generally those are good moves because it's much easier to kind of think graphically and uh, make large operations than go through tons of algebra. Yeah? Definition equals, like it seems at least from like a probability perspective, that's just like, from the axioms of probability, or is this like a Bayesian number specifically? Uh, yeah, so the question is, what about this first definition equals? What I mean here is by the laws of probability. Um, so it's not technically a definition, it's, it follows from the axioms of probability. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. So um, notice that in this world, P and B and E are independent. So this is one way you can kind of uh, see that actually when you define the joint distribution, in that joint distribution, um, two variables, uh, B and E are independent. So one thing to note is that, you know, if we looked at the factor graph, um, you know, which is this thing, and remember last time, we talked about marginalization in factor graphs, and what does that look like? If you do, what happens would you, if you did marginalization in this factor graph? Okay. Yeah, you just remove A, but this factor is, does it disappear? No, it, it doesn't, right? Because factor graphs, remember, the factor graphs don't know anything about this factor um, other than that it's, uh, you know, it returns non-negative numbers. So you would have to keep, hold on to this factor, right? So the moral of the story here is that if you're using factor graphs, if you convert to factor graphs too early, then you might lose out on opportunities to really simplify. Whereas if you look at this, the factor graph of this one, there is no P of A given B and E, right? I mean, just to go back here, factor graphs will create a factor which is summation of A, P of A given B and E, and call that a factor. And we know because these are local conditional distributions, that's just one, so you can just drop it. Okay, so, so that's the first property. To summarize, if you marginalize out leaf nodes, uh, you get Bayesian networks by just dropping them uh, from the graph. So the second property is consistency of local conditionals. As I alluded to before, if you have P, probability of D given A and B, there's two versions of this that you can, might be thinking about. One is the local conditional distribution, which is, again, you just define it as such. And then there is the corresponding quantity that comes about from probabilistic inference. So this quantity is derived from 
taking the definitions, forming the joint distribution, and then using the laws of probability to derive this particular quantity. And this property says that, don't worry about it, the two are equal. So, you know, it means that you can kind of uh, intuitively think about there just can be one notion of probability in your head. But I want to make this explicit, but that this is the, doesn't come necessarily for free. You have to kind of verify it, that this is true. Um, I'm not going to go through the verification step. It's in the uh, notes in the slides, um, but I'll just state it as such. Okay, so um, let's do another example just to um, familiarize, familiarize ourselves with Bayesian networks a little bit more. Um, so the question here is that uh, suppose you have, um, you wake up and you are coughing and you have itchy eyes and you're wondering, do I have a cold or do I have allergies? Okay, so let's follow this four step procedure to define this Bayesian network. Okay, so step one, what are the variables here? There's um, coughing, um, let's denote that as H, um, and itchy eyes, and then cold and allergies, okay? So four random variables, um, how should I connect these things up? Yeah, so H and I should be connected to C, so if you have a cold, you probably have um, uh, a cough and you probably have itchy eyes um, and here you tap into your medical knowledge and um, what, what's that? Yeah, so generally I, I, I'm no doctor, but uh, let's just assume for now that um, allergies uh, Don't really cause a cough they cause itchy eyes. It's probably not true, but let's just pretend it is um, Okay, so just to make the uh, network a little bit more interesting Okay, so those are the edges, and now I have to specify local conditional distributions over all of these. Uh, so what are the local conditional distributions? So I have P of C, P of A, remember one for every node, um, and P of H given C, and over here is P of I given C and A, right? So probability of a node given its parents. And then finally, I have the joint distribution, which is probability of C, A, um, H, I, and this is by definition just the product of everything. Um, for this example, I'm not gonna go through and define the actual tables because that's gonna take too much time, um, but I'm gonna do it in this uh, demo here, okay? so. This is a Bayesian network that I just drew on the board, and this is a, its associated uh, factor graph. Remember, one factor per node. Yeah. PowerPoint switches the uh, the allergies and cold. Uh, C A. Oh, yeah, you're right. Um, I guess that makes sense. Which one makes sense? <laughs> like <a> cold should cause the Yeah. Okay, I got I got a little bit. Uh, confused. Okay. So it should be like this, and then I have to adjust things. Oh. Okay. It's worth fixing this. I given A um, and C and A. Okay. Just for the record, I'll just make this H given C and A, and I given A. Yeah, that wasn't too bad. Okay, thanks for catching that. Okay, so this is the factor graph. Um, and let me show you uh, this demo. So you can click on this and you can see uh, this Bayesian network in this factor graph. Um, and to answer this question, what was the question? The question was, if I have, uh, if you're coughing and have itchy eyes, do you have cold or allergies? So I condition on cough equals one, uh, itchy eyes equals one, and I'm asking for uh, the probability of um, the cold. Okay, and if you work it out, you see that the probability of a cold is uh, 0.13. Um, and, you know, so why does this, 
So okay, I guess I didn't really tell you enough about the actual prior probability. So the probability of a cold is you know, 0.1, um, let's say, and the probability of allergies is you know, 0.2, and then there's a kind of a noisy or where if you're, uh, if you have um, a cold or allergies, then you, you end up coughing, and um, the, if you have uh, itch, uh, allergies, then you have you know, itchy eyes with probability 0.9. Um, and what happened here is that um, if you, oops, um, if you condition on uh, your coughing and you have itchy eyes, um, there's this kind of interesting explaining away happening here, um, where you know even though you didn't observe A, you observe evidence of A, and that's enough to kind of uh, lower the probability that you have a cold. So this is an example shows something a little bit more subtle how information can kind of propagate along the Bayesian network in ways that if you try to do it just kind of intuitively, you'll probably um, not be able to. Okay. Um, so let me summarize so far what we've done. So we've introduced Bayesian networks where we have random variables that capture the state of the world and we have edges between those variables that represent dependencies between um, those variables. And um, based on those dependencies, we go and define local conditional distributions. You multiply all those local conditional distributions, you get a joint distribution. Now with that joint distribution, by laws of probability, you can go and ask probabilistic inference queries and ask questions about the world um, given evidence. And we saw that this captures interesting reasoning patterns such as explaining away. And finally, all of this can be uh, brought under the umbrella of the factor graph interpretation, which we will see is uh, very useful for um, actually doing probabilistic inference in general in a bit. Okay, so any questions before I move on to the next section? Okay. So now I'm gonna talk about probabilistic programs. So this is going to be um, kind of a little bit of a whirlwind tour and hopefully give you a different perspective um, and open your eyes to kind of the possibilities of Bayesian networks. Um, so let's look at this alarm network again. I can write it as on the board um, just a product of all the local conditional probabilities, basically use math. Or I can think about this as a probabilistic program. Okay, so what I'm gonna write down is a program that is a very simple program, um, has three lines, one for every uh, variable. And the first line is B is uh, drawn from Bernoulli epsilon. So this notation just means B is set to uh, a random value that has a distribution Bernoulli epsilon. And same with uh, earthquake. And then finally, I set A equals B or E, okay? Um, and uh, so the idea here is that a probabilistic program is just simply a program with randomness in it that when you run, sets the random variables. So this is, I, I think, a really useful way to think about um, Bayesian networks. And just to maybe be very concrete about this, so you can think about Bernoulli of epsilon as just a Python program that just returns uh, true with a probability epsilon. So here, random less than epsilon, the random is a number between zero and one, has a probability of epsilon being less than epsilon. Okay, any questions about the, what this is doing? Yeah. Why does the randomness help rather than having the determinants? So the question is why does randomness help? Um, the, the reason is that I'm, want this program to be put a distribution over possible assignments. Every time I run the program, it's gonna produce a different assignment. And the distribution over that assignment is the distribution that I'm defining. So, so, so this is kind of an interesting philosophical point. So normally you run programs, and write programs with the intention of running them and do, do something useful. But here the programs are just a kind of an artifact artifact to define a distribution. 
Uh, hopefully, this will become a little bit clearer as I go through more examples. Yeah. If you want to define some distribution, can you just uh, define like hard code the table instead of doing this? I mean, you can just hard code epsilon into your table instead of like maybe writing this program without trying to get the epsilon. Yeah. So the question is, why don't you just uh, hard code define the table directly? Um, instead of running this program. So the intention here again is not to run this program because it's not an efficient way to do probabilistic inference, but it's more of a, a metaphor, a tool to help you get more intuition about um, probabilistic uh, programs and Bayesian networks. So hopefully we, we can uh, come back to this uh, question after I go through a few more examples. <coughs> so here's a more interesting probabilistic program. So suppose you're doing object um, tracking and you define a program which starts with x0 equals 0, 0, so the initial location is at the origin. And then for every time step, um, so I'm writing the program in kind of pseudocode here, um, with probability alpha, I set xi equals xi minus 1 plus 1, 0, so I'm going to the right. And with probability 1 minus alpha, I'm going down. Okay, so um, now this program you know, that I just described, um, it induces a particular Bayesian network structure where each xi is only connected to xi minus one. Okay, so what I'm trying to get you to think about is there's multiple ways of thinking about the same object. And I think when you get, when you can kind of internalize all these things, you kind of get a deeper understanding of what you're dealing with, right? We have the probabilistic of, uh, viewpoint. You can look at the tables, you can look at your equations, you have this graph, and now I'm giving you an additional to all uh, the programs. Okay, so just for fun, um, you can actually run this program. Again, this is not what you would do normally, but um, I can run the program in any case. So every time I hit enter, um, this gives you a different trajectory. So this is a way to visualize the distribution over prob uh, x1 through x um, whatever, how many of many uh, red squares are. And if I change alpha, that gives me distributions which are either skewed to one side or the other side. Um, so that's the distribution over uh, um, no, programs. Oh, sorry, distribution over assignments. Okay, so what does probabilistic inference look like in this setting? So remember, what is probabilistic inference? I'm conditioning on some piece of evidence, and I'm asking for the distribution over some other set of variables. So in case, in this case, I'm conditioning on the fact that I spotted X, uh, the, uh, the object at A2 at time step 10, let's say. And I'm interested where it could have been before that. So um, here what I'm going to do is I'm going to run the forward program and I'm only going to keep those trajectories and show it if X10 equals A2. So if I do that, I'm going to, so this is A2. Um, I'm seeing that the set of uh, possible <coughs> trajectories look like this. So this is the distribution over um, trajectories given x10 equals a2. Okay. So it's important. What I'm trying to get you to think about is a Bayesian network or a project program as what is the distribution. You can visualize the distributions by looking at samples from that distribution. It's another way to think about it, right? Because distributions are, um, think about like, a, suppose you have a, I tell you I have a distribution over images. Now, how do you actually get a hold of that or understand that? Well, probably the easy, easiest way is to draw samples from it and look at kind of the types of images that you get. Question? to specify a joint distribution, or are they like, is this a way to specify a Bayesian network, which is actually the uh, So the question is, is this way a, a way of specifying a joint distribution? By this I mean, I, I guess you mean the, ah, so probabilistic programming in general. It is so, so for every probabilistic pro, um, program, it specifies a joint distribution over the random variables that you set in that program. And vice versa, if I have a Bayesian network, I can write down a probabilistic program. Um, one thing, I'll, as you'll hopefully become clear, is that the reason to think about it in terms of programs is that you can inherit all the nice properties of programs. 
like the ability to find functions or even have recursion or you know you can do a lot more um, fancy stuff with programs that you can't do what I mean which would be hard to do you can think about Bayesian networks as another way to think about it is like okay you're basically writing assembly code right for every uh, um, variable you specify its value but if you have a million value variables sometimes it's useful to be able to structure um, your you know your code in some way and we'll, we'll see that over the next few examples okay so this is going to be a march of I think around seven possible um, or so possible examples and I just want to give you a flavor of types of probabilistic programs that we're talking about here so the first one is called uh, just a Markov. And by pro whenever I say probability program, think Bayesian networks or um, generalizations of that. So Markov model. Um, so this has a lot of applications in um, you know, modeling language or time series. And uh, the program works as follows. For every position, i through n, I'm going to generate a particular uh, word, xi, given the previous word. Okay, so this is also happens to be the same type of program as for the object tracking. Okay, so this is its Bayesian network structure. Um, so here's another one. This is called a hidden Markov model, which um, is, uh, you know, is a very popular uh, model that was um, used uh, for all sorts of things like speech recognition, notably before um, you know the rise of deep learning. Um, so the idea here is that for every time step, t equals one to t, I'm gonna generate an object from location, ht given the previous ht minus one. So this part is just looks like a Markov model, okay? But the, the reason why it's called a hidden Markov model is that I'm not actually gonna observe ht, I'm gonna observe sensor readings et at each time step t given uh, the hidden location. Okay, so this is what a hidden Markov model looks like. Sequence of object locations, which I don't <laughs> observe, and sensor readings, which I do observe, which depend respectively on the given object uh, locations. And just as a convention, whenever I shade a variable, that means I you know, uh, observe it, and if it's not shaded, that means I don't observe it. Okay, so this program defines a joint distribution over all these variables. And now you can ask a particular question. You can do probabilistic inference. And the most um, common thing that people do here is given the sensor readings, where is this object? Which is something we've already been exposed to through the lens of factor graphs, but this is, again, a way to think about it um, through the lens of um, Bayesian networks. So now uh, with this kind of programming metaphor, you can actually do uh, kind of more complicated things in a very kind of succinct way. So uh, to describe uh, multiple object tracking, you can think about uh, there being two objects, A and B, and each position, um, each time step and every object, I'm going to generate a location for that object, and this is going to be two independent um, Markov chains, which are running. Uh, but the thing is that at each time step, I only observe one sensor reading, and that sensor reading is going to be some combination, some function of the actual locations of the objects <coughs> at that particular time step. Okay? So now hopefully you can see a little bit of the advantage of thinking in terms of a program because I can write this kind of very simple four-line program that um, very precisely nails down what the actual you know, model is. Um, and in particular, this factorial HM, as it's called, is something that you're gonna be exploring in your, the car assignment. Um, here's another example. So this is uh, for, usually used for ca classification. It's called Naive Bayes. Some of you might have heard of it. Um, and the program looks like this. You first generate a label, Y. Um, let's suppose you generate travel. And now you're gonna, for every word in your uh, document, you're gonna generate a word. Um, given that label. So if you generate travel, you might generate words like beach and Paris. Um, so now the, that again specifies the distribution over all the variables. What are you typically interested in? If you're interested in classification, you're given the words 
And now you want to go back and uh, figure out what the, the, um, the class is. So given a text document, what is uh, the label? Um, here's a fancier uh, model of documents called latent digital allocation. Um, so here, instead of have generating a single topic, I'm gonna generate a distribution over topics. So this is getting a little bit meta because this random variable itself is actually a distribution, but you know, let's not worry too much about that. So th this is a distribution. Um, and for every position, I'm going to first generate a topic like travel or Europe. And then for that uh, topic, I'm gonna generate a word given that topic. Okay, so this allows you to model documents which talk about multiple things, for example, travel in Europe. Okay, so this is also a very popular model that can be used to, if you're given a collection of documents, try to understand, understand the um, latent structure inside it. Um, <clears throat> So here's one that's kind of a generalization of the, uh, the medical diagnostics um, um, uh, example on the board. So in general, let's say you have a bunch of diseases, um, you generate the activity of a particular di disease in a patient um, according to some you know, prior distribution. And now you, for every symptom that um, you might ob observe or any sort of lab test, you have the probability of some outcome of that symptom given the diseases. And of course, the probability inference question here is, if a patient has particular uh, symptoms, what kind of diseases uh, does, or uh, problems does he or she have? Okay, so I think this is a f maybe the final example. Um, here's a social network analysis example where um, you have um, a set of people each person has a, you know, a, quote, a type, maybe a politician or a scientist, um, and these, for every pair of people, uh, they can either interact or not interact. They might be connected or not connected, let's say in a social network. And so in the end, what you're given is a social network of uh, connectivity, and you're asked, what kind of types of people are there? So generally, you, you observe maybe some graph and you want to understand um, you know, what kind of features or uh, you know, what, is, what is a concrete way of summarizing the types of people there are. And there's, this is called a stochastic block model, but there's other kind of fancier models that are based on a similar idea. So that was a very quick um, you know, s overview of different types of probabilistic programs or Bayesian networks. And there are, the point is that there are many, many different types of models that can be written down in the literature. M many things, generative models can be just written down in a probabilistic program or equivalently a Bayesian network. Um, and all of them kind of have this kind of basic structure. If you observe carefully, all of them kind of look like that. Whereas there's some set of variables, H, um, which you don't observe, and that generates or causes um, a set of variables E, which you do observe. So the mindset when you're designing Bayesian networks is you're coming up with stories of how the data, which you, what you observe, was generated through the quantities of interest, the output. So this is probably kind of maybe counterintuitive and for those of you who are really used to thinking about just normal classification where you, it's the opposite. You start with the input and you think about what are things to do to the input that I can, uh, you know, what kind of things can I do to get it to a point where I can, you know, classify uh, the input, you know, precisely. But Bayesian networks kind of go the opposite. Um, it starts with the output or the structures you're interested in which are presumably kind of more, um, kind of the platonic idea or something cleaner and then you're trying to describe how that clean data gets, or gives rise to this kind of messy, sorry, the clean structure gives rise to the messy data that you observe. Question? Can you explain, I guess, why it's called the output? Um, right, so why is uh, this called the output? Um, so I'm using input-output here in, to borrow terminology for when we talked about classification, where you're going from input to output. Input is what you, are given, and output is what you're out, 
outputting, I guess, producing. Right, and in the, the, the Bayesian network, you first define the model kind of going from output to input, so kind of the opposite of what you would normally do. And now, now there's a second stage where you do probabilistic inference, which reverses that. And you go from the observations, which are the input, to the output, which is right here. Okay. Any other questions about this? All right. So now let's talk about inference. Um, this is also going to be the topic of next lecture, but I'm just going to start um, uh, playing around with this a little bit. So remember what is probabilistic inference? We're given a Bayesian network, define some joint distribution. We're also given some setting of the variables, which are the evidence. For example, I saw that the alarm went off. Um, and I'm interested in a subset of the variables. <coughs> okay, so what I'm trying to produce is a probability of some query variables condition on evidence. And what this really means is I want this for all values of um, the query variables. Okay. So for example, if I have coughing and I have itchy eyes, do I have a cold? It's an example of a probability inference query. Okay, so let's start with this simple example. Suppose I have this Markov model and I ask this query, what is the probability of x3 given x2 equals five? The condition on x2 equals five, I'm interested in x3. Um, so at this point, you already have the tools uh, to do this. Um, and I'm gonna show you how you can just uh, go through the calculations. And then I'm gonna show you an easier way to do this. So if you, we're just showing this right now. This is probably what you would um, do, which might be a little bit tedious. Uh, so by laws of probability, this, so this conditioning is equal to the joint over this um, marginal. Okay, so, um, this is just by definition of conditional probability. Um, and uh, one thing I'm gonna do here is um, notice that I'm only interested in distributions over x3. So from that perspective, this denominator is just a constant. <coughs> it doesn't depend on x3. So what I'm gonna write is this proportional to, which means that the actual value here is this thing on the right-hand side times some constant, which um, I don't care about. And the reason I can do this and I don't care about it is because I know that um, the left-hand side is a distribution. So whatever I get on the right-hand side if it sums to six or something, then I just divide by six and I get a distribution. Okay, so this is gonna save you a lot of work if you use a proportional to sign. But you have to use it carefully, otherwise you can get wrong answers. Okay, so let's expand this. So this is a marginal distribution of x2 and x3. Um, I can write it in terms of the joint where I sum over the variables that I don't care about. So there's again, laws of probability. Um, and then the definition of the uh, Bayesian network here is the joint distribution is equal to uh, the product of the local conditional distributions. So right now I have a uh, lowercase p now because they're local distributions. Um, now I'm gonna do some algebraic manipulation. So notice that um, this stuff doesn't depend on x4, so I can push the summation of x4 over here. And then these two first two terms um, uh, only these first two terms depend on x1, so I can group this and to have the sum over x1 apply here. Um, and then I can look over here and use, what is the sum to? One, so I can drop it. And then what is this? Does this depend on x3? Nope, so I can also drop that, and I get a p of x3 given x2 equals five. Um, so this hopefully shouldn't be surprising to anyone because remember that slide when I said uh, consistency of local conditional distributions? This is, should be equal to this and this is just one way of verifying that uh, that's actually the case for this example. Okay, um, so you know this was, you can do this. I mean for this one it's actually not that bad especially when you already know the answer. Um, but I promise you there are gonna be situations where you definitely don't want to grind through all the math because you can fill up 
10 pages of equations. Um, I'm going to show you kind of a faster way to do this. Um, and so let's uh, start. Okay. So this is going to be a five step uh, procedure, but in many cases, not all the steps are necessary. Um, okay, so let me erase this. And the key idea is going to be to use the structure of the Bayesian network um, and factor graphs to simplify some of these operations. Okay, so um, let's start with, okay, so you have x1, um, x2, x3, x4, um, that four, okay? All right, so, and I'm um, conditioning on um, x2, right? Okay, so x2, uh, this takes on value five. Okay, so, um, the f and I'm interested in this uh, query variable. So the first thing I want to do is, I want to remove as many variables as I can. Um, I just, because that's gonna simplify my life. So I'm going to remove or marginalize um, non-ancestors of uh, the query and the variable I'm conditioning on. So by non-ancestors, I mean um, anything that's upstream, I am gonna keep for now. Anything that's downstream, I can let go. Okay, so what can I remove here? X4, right? So I can, um, let me show this. So I can graphically just remove X4. And that corresponds to, on the slide, basically the fact that this thing sums to one. But I've done this again graphically, which hopefully should be uh, more intuitive. Okay, so the second step is I'm going to convert to a factor graph. Um, because uh, one already takes care of, and basically I'm exploiting the properties of Bayesian networks. But after I've done one, um, I don't, it's simpler to think about it as a factor graph, where I want to think about uh, the factors more explicitly as just arbitrary functions and not worry about which way the conditioning is going. Because it's really easy to get confused by um, Bayesian networks where you're wondering like, oh, this is conditioning over here, what's a marginal distribution? And um, factor graphs, I think, by actually s removing the directionality and sem uh, semantics actually make things a little bit easier. Okay, so I'm gonna convert this into a factor graph, which means I have, um, let me actually just draw it down here again. So here's a factor graph. Um, Remember, I have a probability of x1, um, probability of x2 given x1, um, so this might look like more uh, work <coughs> right now uh, because I'm making things explicit, um, but you can actually do a lot of these things in your head if you um, get the hang of it. So remember, every variable has a, is associated with a factor. Um, okay. So now I want to, um, you know, condition on on the you know, evidence. So I'm conditioning on x two equals five. So remember what the conditioning does. Remember from last week's lecture. Conditioning just removes this and changes the factors to be set to the value that that um, we will take on. Yeah, question. Is for the x4? Oh, sorry. Yeah, we shouldn't have x4. Good point. Okay. So we just have a factor on that other side? Or? This factor should be there. So x4 is, this is the factor graph corresponding to that. Yeah. Um, okay, so I'm conditioning on x2, so I wipe x2 from the face of the earth, and I'm going to set this, change this factor to be a partial evaluation of where I put uh, x2 equals five, and this factor is x2 equals five given x1, okay? Um, so this connection is good, so now I um, can marginalize out the disconnected components. 
Um, and these are the components that I don't, I remember I care about X3. So this stuff is disconnected, so uh, I don't care about it. So I'm just going to, um, let's say, you know, just cross it out. And that operation corresponds to the fact that, you know, this thing over here, I just can drop because it's um, not related to X3. It's just a constant. Okay, so finally, um, the fifth step is actually uh, <coughs> do work. Okay, so what does that mean? Um, you might not be so lucky to be left with just you know, a single variable with a factor where, where that's just the answer. Um, in that case, you actually have to um, actually compute do the marginalization operations that we saw last week. In this case, we are fortunate that um, this factor, this actually represents the distribution of X3, so that is just the answer to you know, the problem. Okay? But I'll go through some other examples where it's not as obvious. Okay? So this is a, just a general strategy that I outlined on the board here. And again, I think once you get kind of good at this, you can Basically, the steps um, one and four should be kind of very um, kind of visual because you can just see, ah, well, all everything downstream just clearly doesn't matter. And when you see these um, <clears throat> these are uh, you know conditioning things, you can kind of automatically just not ignore things and just jump directly to five. So that's the idea. I'm just doing things that are more explicitly on the board so you can kind of see where things are coming from. Okay, so um, I'm gonna do another example. Um, this is an alarm. So uh, here I have this major network and I, let's suppose I'm interested in probability of B. Okay, so this should be an easy one. So start with one, marginalize out non-answers. So, so which are the non-answers to so B? So A and E, right? So I just remove them from the face of the earth and I'm just left with uh, this single uh, variable B and obviously it has a factor of P of B and then I'm done. Okay, okay so this one's a, maybe a little bit more um, you know, complicated. So this is the oh, probability of earth, oh, sorry, burglary given A equals one. Um, so let's go through this example. Um, <coughs> Try to do it quickly. All right. So I'll have um, B, E, and A. Um, okay. So marginalize out non ancestors. So what am I interested in? I'm interested in the probability of uh, B given A equals 1. Okay. So I have A and B that I care about. So what are the non ancestors of these variables? There's none. Right, so this is the ancestor of A, so I can't remove it. So can't do anything there, too bad. Convert to a factor graph, we've done this before. Probability of B. Um, moralize the parents. So this is probability of A given B and E. And then this is probability of E, okay. Um, condition on the evidence now. So I condition on A equals uh, one, so I'm going to remove this and change this factor to a equals one given uh, b and e. Um, fourth step is marginalize out anything that's <coughs> disconnected. Uh, nothing's disconnected, so I can't do anything. And rats, I have to do actual work. Okay. So what does actual work mean here? I'm interested in the probability of b, so I need to marginalize out e. And I have to do this kind of a hard way um, based on last time. Uh, last lecture, so um, what I'm going to do here is, you know, what happens when I marginalize out E? I create a new factor. Let, let me actually replicate this down here so it doesn't get too confusing. Um, so I create a new factor, and this new factor, let's call it F of B, um, which is the Markov blanket <coughs> of E. There's only one other variable, B. And this is going to be the product of all the factors here that touch this variable that I'm marginalizing out. 
And the only difference between this and what we're doing last time is before we had a max because we were doing maximum weight assignments. And here I'm going to have a sum because we're doing probabilities and marginalizing. So this is going to be a summation over here. Okay. And then the final query is going to be uh, just the product of those two things. Okay. Um, I'm not going to have time to actually drill down into expanding these values, um, but if you actually uh, plug in epsilons into these, um, then you'll find that the probability of B equals 1 given um, A equals 1 is 1 over 2 minus epsilon, which is, um, remember, 0.51 is for epsilon equals 0 0.05. Okay, but this calculation, um, you know, you can look into the slides to see how this is actually done, but it's just algebra. Okay, um, so th there's another example which I'm going to defer to section to talk about. Um, I think in all of this, you just need to do some practice and get kind of comfortable doing these operations. Um, to summarize, define Bayesian networks. Uh, there's this way of uh, defining models that um, allow you to specify locally and optimize globally. Once you have a Bayesian network, you can do probabilistic inference where you condition on evidence and query variables of interest. And next time, we're going to focus on number five and hopefully not do things completely manually, but do things more automatically. Okay, that's it.